Uh, before beginning my introduction of our first speaker, I think I'd be remiss not to mention uh, my observation from the floor, and that is there is an overwhelming number of young faces in the crowd. And considering that this is a Sunday, this is your time off from studies or work, for you to come out here to hear us uh, talk about freedom of speech and political correctness, uh, to me is an indication that there is uh, a zeitgeist among uh, millennials, among young people right now. And I know we've got disciples of Piaget and, and Orwell and Huxley among the crowd. Uh, myself as a somewhat young Hegelian, I can't help but think that um, dialectics is real. Uh, the, the, the mainstream media, the, the academic pulpit, um, what we've been fed um, as the thesis, we're now pushing back. And there is a new antithesis that is forming, and God willing, um, the synthesis that comes out of it uh, errs on the side of freedom, not social justice, uh, truth, and not political correctness. Our, next, our, our first distinguished guest is a man who introduced neuroplasticity to the world. The idea that our brains are not rigidly hardwired as was once believed, but that they can change and indeed be rewired. Dr. Norman Deutsch is a Canadian-born psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and a world-famous professor on the faculties of both the University of Tor uh, Toronto and Columbia University in New York. Dr. Deutsch began as an award-winning poet and student of lit literary classics and philosophy at the University of Toronto. He obtained his medical degree at the University of Toronto, then moved to New York, where he's had a residency in psychiatry and obtained a degree in psychoanalysis at Columbia's University Department of Psychiatry and Columbia University Center for Psychoanalytical Training and Research. This was followed by a two-year Columbia University slash National in uh, pardon me, Institute of Mental Health Research Fellowship, where he was trained in empirical science techniques. Dr. Deutsch has written over 170 scientific and popular articles, as well as he appearing on several television programs and various documentaries. His New York Times internationally best-selling mind-bending book, The Brain That Changes Itself with Over One Million Copies Sold, describes how the principle of healing the plastic brain is becoming established in fact in laboratories, through a greater understanding of the ways in which circuits of neurons function and are created by thought. And Dr. Deutsch's more recently published book, The Brain's Way of Healing, presents astounding discoveries in the brain's healing power. He is persuasive and curious as a writer, a rigorous thinker, while the subjects on which he writes are at the very edge of our current understanding of the mind and body. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Norman Deutsch. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Thank you, Faith, and thank you, Joffrey, and thank all of you for coming um, to this talk, which is a, shows a kind of civic-mindedness and uh, reaching beyond oneself. I'm going to um, approach this subject from a particular vantage point, which links up some things that are, I think are very important in classic political philosophy and what we know about psychology in the brain. So I'm going to call it the infallible state of mind. And this is George Eliot, perhaps the most philosophical of, of novelists in a way. Um, and in Middle March, her masterpiece, or one of her masterpieces, there's this. And this is the epigraph, in a way, for my talk. Her anger said, as anger is apt to say, that God was with her, that all heaven must be on her side. So you can think about that as the talk goes on. The problem we face today is really a very simple one in an open society. People are different, and so we have disagreements about important matters. How do we sort through these disagreements and even perhaps benefit from the different points of view, but also avoid splitting apart into warring factions or violence in the process. These are the topics today that I'm going to discuss. First, are freedom of speech and political correctness mutually exclusive? Then I'm going to present the classical liberal argument for freedom of speech. It's not just because I want to speak that I ought to be allowed to speak. And why free speech, liberal democracy, and individual liberty are inseparable why you can't really have one without the other. 
I'm going to discuss why robust freedom of speech is the best protection that exists for minorities and for marginal groups, and how the practice of political correctness intentionally undermines freedom of speech and unintentionally undermines many of its own stated goals. And then finally, I'm going to weave into this my understanding of the infallible frame of mind that feels so confident in shutting down others. So our freedom of speech and political correctness mutually exclusive. This is our world. And you'll notice that the free countries are in green, and the purple ones are authoritarian or totalitarian regimes, and the yellow ones are somewhat in the middle, partly free. And the first thing that strikes one is that most of the green is kind of to the west. And the exceptions to that, countries like Israel, India, Australia, even South Africa, have had some impact um, from, have, have been influenced to some extent, often in a major way, often as a colony, um, or dominated by the British. And many of these ideas about freedom of speech come from the British tradition. You'll also notice that there are these are huge land masses, and they, they seem almost equal. In the countries that are, 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 are purple, there's very limited equality of rights for women, for gays, um, for various religious minorities. Those rights exist in the countries that are green. So it looks like it's kind of 50-50, freedom versus authoritarianism. But actually, if you look at this by population, only 9.9% .9 of us live in democracies. That's kind of shocking. The rest of us live in highly flawed democracies with limited rights or hybrid regimes, and 34%, so three and a half times, live in authoritarian regimes. So democracy is not in fantastic shape if you look at things in terms of population. And ideas like freedom of speech, um, if they're only really substantiated in 9.9% .9 of people on the planet, arguably are an endangered species, or they at least can't be taken for granted. And that's one of the reasons I'm here today. But why discuss this in the West? In a way, we have more freedom of speech than ever before. With the internet, anyone can publish a blog, can set up their own media company, develop social media websites. And in some respects, the taste for freedom of expression is rising. And yet, that same electronic media has made it possible for everyone to monitor everyone, for your boss to monitor you, for your government to monitor you. And so, suddenly, the temptation of blocking expression is also um, something to be taken very seriously. Some recent examples of political correctness. So President Obama, responding to the rise of political correctness on campus, gave a speech in Iowa in September 2015. In a way, you might argue that he articulated in a colloquial way, the basic liberal argument. By liberal, I mean the classical liberal argument for liberty and freedom of speech. The purpose of college is to create a space where a lot of ideas are present, he said, and collide. When I went to college, suddenly there were some folks who didn't think at all like me. And if I had an opinion about something, they'd look at me and they'd say, well, that's stupid. And then they'd describe how they saw the world. And they might have had a different sense of politics, or they might have a different view about poverty, or they might have a different perspective on race. And sometimes their views would be infuriating to me. But it was because there was this space where you could interact with people who didn't agree with you that I then started testing my own assumptions. And sometimes I realized, you know what? Maybe I've been too narrow-minded. Maybe I didn't take this into account. Maybe I should see this person's perspective. So that's what college, in part, is all about. And here's him going on just after that. I was just talking to, to a friend of mine about this. You know, I, I've, I've heard some college campuses where they don't want to have a guest speaker 
who, you know, is too conservative, or they don't want to read a book if it has language that is offensive to African Americans, or somehow sends a, a demeaning signal towards women. And, you know, I, I got to tell you, I, I don't agree with that either. You know, I, I don't agree that you, when you become students at colleges, have to be coddled and protected from different points of view. You know, it, it, I, I think that you should be able to, you know, you, you should invite anybody, you know, who, anybody who comes to speak to you and you disagree with, you should have an argument with them. But you shouldn't silence them by saying you can't come because, you know, my sense, I'm too sensitive to hear what you have to say. Um, that's, not, that's not the way we learn either. So what do you think, Arnie? Amen. He said amen. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, the president used the words coddled and protected and not listening to people because we are too sensitive to hear what you have to say. And coddling and overprotecting, it might seem, would produce non-resilient, passive people. But coddling can also cause people to become self-focused, entitled, and disrespectful of others. In other words, silencing others is not always a very pretty thing. So there was the Yale Halloween crisis. Um, and some Yale students complained to the administration that it was offering very heavy-handed advice, telling them that they would be insensitive to wear costumes that symbolize cultural appropriation. At that point, Erica Christakis, who was a Yale lecturer and a specialist in childhood education, and who had with her husband been involved in supervising one of the residences at Yale, she wrote an email encouraging students to stand up for their own right to decide what to wear and not cede control to others to make moral decisions for them. And she said, if you object to others' costumes, speak up by all means. Now, a faction of students then demanded that the Christakis's be fired. Now, one of the things that was happening is there were groups at Yale saying that they felt there was not enough respect for um, cultural diversity uh, along lines of race and so on. But this was the event, the uh, Erica Christakis email, that triggered things. After she wrote that email, her husband, Nicholas, tweeted President Obama saying the things I just showed you, saying, you know, we shouldn't try to overprotect students. And then in this very widely viewed video, one young woman, and then I'm going to show you more, came up to um, Nicholas Christakis with about 100 other students at a protest um, to speak to him. And I use the word speak in quotation marks. While you watch this, try to analyze what's happening here. The exception is because other people have rights too, not just walk, me. Walk away. Walk away. It doesn't deserve to be listened to. I do not. Be quiet. For all human beings. Do you understand that? As your position as master, it is your job to create a place of comfort and home for the students that live in Tillman. You have not done that. By sending out that email, that goes against your position as master. Do you understand that? No, I don't agree with that. Then, then why the fuck did you accept the position? Because what I have the a fuck hired you? I have a different vision. You should step down. If that is what you think about being a master, you should step down. It is not about creating an intellectual space. It is not. Do you understand that? It's about creating a home here. You are not doing that. You're supposed You're going to be our advocate. That. Not sleep at night. We're out, we're out. You're disgusting. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> so amongst the things she said is, you are not to create an intellectual space here. Um, this should be a safe haven. It should be a home. Um, and where the function of college goes is hard to say. But one might argue this was just one person who had a bad day and was, was, was very upset. But it wasn't just one person. Oops, sorry. It went on and for quite a while. Do you even I know apologize for causing pain. I was looking for the right words. You have Hello? created space really for violence. I disagree with that. I disagree with that. You all get a toys here. I disagree. I disagree that I've fostered violence. I disagree with that statement. Can I just really quickly? Yes. What is your name? You don't need to bend down. I'm not bending. What's your name? I don't want to. I do not want to shake your hand. I do not want. I. I do not respect you. I don't hear that. I'm looking at the smirk in your face, and I. I'm disgusted. Okay. I am sick. And I'm sick watching them argue with you after we've been standing outside literally for at least five to six hours between you and Holloway. Between last night to now, we've been arguing with people who are not willing to be listened to for a long time. And all I see from you is arrogance mm -hmm. and ego. I am sick looking at you. I am disgusted watching Alex argue with you. You are not listening. You are disgusting. I don't think you understand that. And before I wasn't, I, before I was not angry, per se, I was disappointed maybe. I thought maybe there was room for, for an apology. You've clearly told us that you do not plan to offer an apology for your words. You left the meeting last night to go home and then tweet, do not interrupt me, to tweet from your Twitter and then the Silliman's Twitter. You show no remorse. You tried to let your wife leave that conversation without having answered for herself. That is disgusting. That is sick. And now, I wasn't angry before. I was not angry before, but now I am actually angry, sir. I really, do not interrupt me. I was not angry, and now I want your job to be taken from me. I don't want you to have this job. I am disgusted knowing that you work at Yale University where I will get my degree, where I will look back and think I have to argue with you. The Halloween problem had to do with cultural appropriation. Some people would be dressing up um, as different different groups. Cultural appropriation is about who can say what. In 2015, the University of Ottawa Student Federation canceled a free yoga class. It had been going on for about eight years. It was taught at the Center for Students with Disabilities. It was free. Again, I say that. And it was closed down because some students were uncomfortable with the cultural issues involved. And when asked for explanations, it had to do with the fact that yoga was from India, and the instructor was not from India, and so she had no right to teach it, and it wasn't even clear that people in the West had the right to teach yoga to others, so there, were, there was no right to offer, offer that. Let's talk about fiction. The PC issue about fiction is who can write what? It's argued that a person of one religion, race, or gender cannot create a fiction character of, uh, who is another religion, or race, or gender. It's cultural appropriation. It's identity theft. But why, I would say, stop at writing? Why, following that reasoning, should anyone be permitted to read fiction, which involves recreating characters who are different from ourselves in our heads? This the problem is important because reading fiction, as Drs. Raymond Marr, Keith Oatley, and Professor Peterson here today have shown, actually increases empathy for readers. If we wrote the kind of fiction demanded, the art form would disappear and be replaced by adenine memoir, me talking about myself, and I would add to myself probably, it wouldn't be very interesting. So political correctness is not just about correct action, but correct thought, and seeks to limit the imagination. So forgive me for quoting a novelist, um, therefore, but censorship is rarely self-limiting. This is from Saul Bellows' Augie March, first page. Everyone knows there is no firmness or accuracy of suppression. If you hold down one thing, 
you hold down the adjoining. If there's an idea that's forbidden, there's something similar to it or connected to it that's arguably forbidden. And so it, it's a kind of hunt, of, it's a kind of exercise of scrupulosity that is not self-limiting. People have tried to understand what's going on here. I mean, President Obama picked it up. There's a kind of hypersensitivity sensitivity afoot. And this first showed itself in the 1990s and late 1980s. And Camille Paglia, the independently minded feminist, um, thinker, art historian, uh, student of literature, wrote an article called The Nur Nursery School Campus. She wondered, what's new here? She noted, and has noted it since, the hyperprotective helicopter parenting that seems to undermine resilience and independence. Overprotected people will turn to adults or the legal system to protect them, encouraging authorities to regulate and censor others around them, and perhaps encouraging them to, as we saw with the Halloween costumes, censor themselves. This is so different from the 60s where students were seeking freedom. There are new smaller one to two children families which encourage a feeling in the child that the world of adults revolves around the child. Compare that to families 150 years ago, or families in Quebec, you know, 70 years ago, where you have five to 10 children, and you're raised by your siblings. They don't buy that bullshit. They don't think you're so special. OK, then there are the denatured urban upbringings, people with limited experience in nature, farming, rural life, where self-reliance is a key virtue, think that most of life's upbringings stem not from nature, but societal ills, human decisions about how to distribute goods, awards, and status. And how about the zero tolerance policies in schools? Encur they encourage immoderation, and they encourage ignoring context of, of difficulties that they're assessing. Political correctness as a term evolved out of the Russian Revolution. It comes from Russian. It was used by the Leninist left to describe keeping to the party line or the spirit of the party, party move. And Lenin himself wrote a number of articles about the importance of holding correct political views. So there would be debates, and some people would differ about certain things, but certain views were not politically correct. They didn't go with doctrine. Now, PC was then used by the left later on with conscious irony as a, as a kind of insult to describe someone on the left who had too much fervor towing the party line. So their, their tendency to dogma and doctrine was so intense that it, 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 it obscured their own humanity. So that ironic use of PC, and not as a compliment, was, became mainstream in the 1990s to more or less describe the techniques and attitudes designed to influence um, society to toe the party line of the liberal portion of the left. Not all of the left is a liberal. So these are the techniques that are familiar to all of us to attack freedom of speech or expression or invalidate speakers and shut them down. We have speech codes that determine what people can't say. They proscribe or forbid. We have forced speech which mandates what people must say. It prescribes and puts words in people's mouth. We have dress codes, as in the Halloween situation, or other, 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 other examples. Non-platforming, the term not giving a person a platform, which was, as I understand, originally used in Britain to describe not giving violent fascists a platform. And then it was very quickly applied to not giving anyone from Israel a platform. And then it generalized to not giving a platform to people we disagree with. You can boycott lectures. You can block entrances to lectures. You can drown out lecturers with noise machines, shouting, fire alarms. Professor Peterson's experienced much of this. And you can pour foul human substances on people, if that's your thing. And then you can get a huge, you can organize to forbid institutional invitations. So the BDS movement to shut out all the attempt to shut out all Israeli academics from having a right to speak, mostly in Europe and North America, would be an example of that. And then internet flash mobs, petitions. I mean, 
it's pretty hard not to get a petition of 20,000 people objecting to something or someone. It's so easy. Anonymous character assassination. Internet misinformation. So at uh, the pro free speech rally at the University of Toronto, someone um, accosted Professor Peterson and said, why are there Nazis at this your, your, your rally, Peterson? But there were no Nazis at the rally. Um, but that kind of thing just kept getting repeated over and over. And that's a kind of character assassination attempt. So we're here with a man who survived one character assassination attempt. Um, then there are threats of shaming to create a chill in classrooms, campus, and society at large. And you know, that's part of the reason I'm here today. Because I have seen things written by students that they feel they cannot, even at my blessed university, discuss many, diff many important subjects. One of those letters was actually published in the varsity about a student who was in a bioethics class. And they were discussing sexuality. And they even discussed aspects of transgenders. And he wanted just to do a paper on it. And his very thoughtful, uh, decent professor basically just dissuaded him. So there are things that we're not allowed to, to talk about or think about. Now, privilege. Privilege is used to say that people who are not from a protected group, which is often put into legislation or in the popular mind, are not entitled to speak on certain issues, certain key issues. So privilege limits who can speak. And it's based on the assumption that people from what is designated as a non, uh, sorry, as a, as a non-vulnerable group carry a kind of original sin based on the group that they come from. It's usually buttressed by a narrative stating that the person's ancestors did terrible things and had life easy, hence the privilege. By the way, the word privilege also was used by, by the early communists to describe the bourgeois. And in the early parts of the revolution, it was sufficient to be bourgeois to be rounded up and shot because you had privilege. And of course, many people, many thoughtful people, are scratching their heads because they find it hard to distinguish this kind of categorization from bigotry, since it prejudges people by the group they come from. One of the politically correct methods that's evolving is what I call asymmetrical lawfare. So asymmetrical lawfare is writing law or legal code or institutional code to give an advantage to an accuser who would shut down the free expression of others. And how do you do this? Well, we re-examine evidentiary criteria and you know, what counts for some kind of illicit act or problematic activity. So if you can't prove aggression, allege a new category, microaggression. This involves defining hate speech, discrimination, and harassment down. In other words, lowering the threshold of each of these. These things are important things. The definitions are sliding and changing. If you can't prove malintention or any intention, say the harm is done unintentionally, and that can be every bit as much a human rights violation. And then you define words up. So words become action. And a critical word becomes violence. Now, is speech violence? Is speech action? Well, you know, at times speech is action. The philosopher J.L. Austin in How to Do Things with Words pointed out that language can have what he called a performative aspect. So when a bride or groom says, I do, or a general says, I attack, the speaker is doing something with words that has a legal consequence. But does the fact that some words can be given a legal context sometimes mean that all words we disagree with should be seen as violent actions? That is the question. Now, these are PC values. Inclusiveness, tolerance, anti-prejudice, diversity, openness to difference, kindness and compassion, living together, non-judgmentalism, transparent, transparency. And increasingly, one hears people talking the language of seeking a therapeutic culture where we create a world where everyone feels good and their feelings are valued and respected. That is the PC understanding of a therapeutic culture. Um, now, if you look at these, I think it's pretty clear that many Canadians support these values. 
I think it's also clear that these are placeholders that many people define somewhat differently. And when it gets down to the nitty gritty and you said something like diversity, well, what exactly do you mean by that? But these words have a great plastic power, not neuroplastic, but just plastic, you know, in the sense that they're very evocative and there's a, a, a lot of, quote, forgive the, the dirty word, buy-in um, to these words if you just use these words and don't think through how to use them. And the other thing about them is they're all about justice and equality. They're all about good things. So why the utterly intolerant behavior if these are your goals? Is it simply a case of weakness of will? P people who are PC care for these values, but like many of the rest of us, they fail to live up to their values. Why intolerant? Is it a case of projection, unable uh, to be tolerant, kind, and open as much as they would sincerely wish to be? Do they have a guilty conscience? And to deal with that, do they then project their faults onto others, righteously condemn them, feeling themselves pure of heart? There was a lot of projection, by the way, in the little video I showed. Do you remember when, wipe that smirk off your face. Did you see that smirk? I could, I could not see that smirk. Um, but it must have been fun to give him the gears. Um, now remember, when you project one of your faults onto another person, you become blind to it yourself. That's the purpose of projection. Again, why the non-compassionate, non-inclusive, intolerant behavior? Are social justice warriors simply opportunists using these commonly shared values that I showed you as the ideal tools, the ideal hammers to attack those they're competing with for political power? Remember, these values of inclusion are shared by many of us. That's why being accused of being a racist or a sexist or something very much stings, and anyone with a good conscience, anyone with a conscience, is, very, is quickly frozen by such an accusation. Interestingly, those who don't have much of a conscience are not frozen by such an accusation. But as the accusations are repeated over and over and over, they begin to lose their potency, which is a problem because there is such a thing as racism. It's sort of like a government that's just printing more and more money. Soon your dollar doesn't do anything. And then there's this question, considering how inclusive and kumbaya these values are, why do social justice warriors call themselves warriors and not peacemakers, for instance? So let's turn now to the classic articulation of freedom of speech. Um, this is not the only stream. There are judicial streams, etc. But I actually prefer the philosophical stream to the judicial stream. So this is John Stuart Mill, who wrote On Liberty in 1859. And he prefaced the book with a quote of a sentence from another book. But this sentence very much sums up much of what On Liberty is about. So it's from the great Wilhelm von Humboldt. The grand leading principle towards which every argument unfolded in these pages directly converges is the absolute and essential importance of human development in its richest diversity. It's almost as though it might have been written by a certain kind of psychologist. But it's about human flourishing and thriving. And somehow or other, liberty is about that in a very big way. Now, he makes clear in the book that there's a fundamental opposition between individual liberty and tyranny. They're fundamentally opposed. As liberty increases, authoritarianism decreases, and vice versa. Now, Mill did get involved in uh, pol political, um, the politics of his day. He wrote The Subjection of Women, one of the first uh, feminist books. Uh, he wrote on, ut uh, ut on utilitarianism. He wrote on liberty with his wife, Harriet Taylor, uh, who very much influenced the book and who passed away before it was published. I mean, most of the book was obviously his, but um, he learned a lot from her. He worked to extend the vote. And he was one of the best educated people in the 19th century. He learned ancient Greek at the age of three, and his autobiography is famous for these kinds of things.
So whenever somebody wants to limit free speech, the first thing out of their mouth is, I love free speech, but, or we believe in free speech, but, free speech always has limits. And Mill would agree with that. The difference is that Mill wrote his book to create a space for free speech that would be reasonable. And often when people are limiting it, they're trying to move in the other direction. So let's look at one of the many ways he articulated this. No one pretends that actions should be as free as opinions. On the contrary, even opinions lose their immunity when the circumstances in which they're expressed are such as to constitute their expression a positive instigation to some mischievous act. And then he gives examples, like a positive instigation of a mischievous act would be the following. There are a lot of poor people, and the corn growers have stopped growing corn to protect prices. They assemble around the home of the corn grower, and then you speak to them and yell and talk about how the corn growers are starving you to death. That would be seen as incitement to an angry gr group of people that's becoming a mob and could le immediately lead to violence. So the threshold is fairly high there. But also notice, he, he says, no one pretends that action should be as free as opinions. It's very clear in his mind that actions are not opinions, and opinions are not actions. Words are not actions. They have to be distinguished if we are to get the space that President Obama says we need. Freedom of speech for Mill is not just a right. It is a necessity. It is a necessity for the functioning of a democracy. It is the oil that makes, or the fuel that makes the engine grow and for the healthy uh, um, functioning of the individual. Why? Because human history is filled with error. Error, error, error. Error coming from authority, from faith, from religion, from political claims, from science, from ideologues, augury, prophecy, and from common sense. So this error must be examined. And I don't have to list all the scientific errors we've made over the years, and I can list a few we're making right now, but it, this is not the time for it. Free speech and inquiry are our best chance to overcome our extraordinary all human, all too human proclivity for error. Now, it's important to understand how freedom and then how freedom of speech emerges. And in a few elegant paragraphs, Mills just lays this out. For most of human history, humanity has lived under tyranny or authoritarian rule. And if you think of the map I just showed you, we're pretty close to that today as well. Authoritarian regimes are run by the few who, who see their subjects as their belongings, their chattel, and they use violence against them when they please, take their property as they wish, and prosecute and punish them at will. The law in this situation is, as, Adan, as, as Saddam Hussein said, the law is the two lines above my signature. Now, why is free speech so frightening to the tyrant? He has a lot of power. It, he rules through fear, and so he never really knows whom he can trust, and that can include some of his generals. The tyrant and his crew are ultimately a minority, and the people are many. And so it's important for the tyrant that the people are not allowed to publicly share the extent to which they suffer under his rule, because then they might organize against him the tyrant, the emperor, the dictator, and the odds are in their favor. So if you think about the story of the emperor's new clothes, as Stephen Pinker has argued, when that child speaks out and tells the truth in that story and says the emperor is naked, it's not that the adults have not seen that he is naked. As individuals, they have seen it. But when the little boy speaks up in the crowd, now everyone knows that everyone knows. So emperors and tyrants create an atmosphere of fear to silence people and stop them from talking about things that really everybody knows. Now, when the first democracies developed, something happened to the relationship between the people and their rulers. It was reversed. The people no longer worked for or were owned by the government, but the government worked for we the people. These are John Locke's ideas, very liberating ideas. 
power is now with the people, a large group, and they only lend it via elections to some few of their number to rule them temporarily. And because the people choose their rulers in elections, they came to see themselves as both free and self-governing. And self-governing people, being a large group, require free speech to deliberate about their actions. The laws, the, the war, peace, who will represent them, and so on. And free speech, therefore, involves challenging ideas about what we should do as a community. And it's essential um, that they're challenged over and over again to learn the strengths and weaknesses of these um, monumental decisions that we make. This can only be done in dialogue where criti uh, no criticisms are off limits. But elective officials with authority or other vested interests are always tempted to limit the discussion, of course. The other thing I should say is that the liberal education, which is what universities are, are supposed to be offering, was originally thought to be an education in liberty. Self-governing people need to be educated in some way in the craft of leadership. And the liberal education meant familiarizing yourself with some of the core texts that helped people to become free so that they could understand that. There's not a lot of that going on even at great universities. It's kind of like a boutique or niche study at this point. But that's why they were called the liberal arts, an education to liberty. Now, this is very important for us today. Democracies aren't perfect. Um, we can be a great friend of democracy, but a, the, a, the greatest of friends does not flatter his friend. Mill observed that in democracies, even though the people rule, there can still be threats to free speech and liberty. This is because, strictly speaking, in democracy, not all people rule at any one time. Rather, the majority rules. And the majority holds sway not just over government, but over large sectors of public opinion. As Tocqueville, Alexis de Tocqueville observed, in democracy, a tyranny of the majority can always arise in which the many can suppress the few. The majority inflated by their power, their sense of self-certainty, their sense of legitimacy brought about by their greater number, their bulk, can begin to act with a reckless confidence and indifference to others, perhaps not unlike an absolute prince. So following Tocqueville, Mill paid much attention to the fact that custom and public opinion and common ideas can also tyrannize over people. And that, in fact, often in our everyday life, these customs and these opinions can be actually more problematic than even government and laws. Because it can put limits on liberty of those who think and act differently from the rest. And it can do, do it by all, measure, all, all, all different means, shaming, ostracism, and so on. So that you can ruin a life with these things. So why do I say that freedom of speech is especially, it's, a, it's essential for all of us. We can't function without it in a democracy. But why is it especially important for, for people who are from minorities, and marginalized groups, people who carry minority opinions? I'm sure many of you carry minority opinions in, in some areas. It's this. One person can't outvote 100. A minority can never outvote a majority. But one person or a minority with a superior argument can publish, write, and speak to 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 or a million people, and that gives them a chance. That's why it's folly for members of smaller groups to undermine freedom of speech. Absolute folly. Now, what about the psychology of the person who's doing the undermining? Here, Mill says, introduces a theme. To deny others f speech is to presume oneself infallible. A person may say, I'm denying you speech because you make me feel, uh, because what you do will lead to violence. But they're presuming it will lead to violence. They have to show it or prove it. So here's what Mill says. The opinion which is attempted to suppress by authority may possibly be true. Those who desire to suppress it, of course, deny its truth. 
but they are not infallible. They have no authority to decide the question for all mankind and exclude every other person from the means of judging. Now, I submit to you that is a very democratic sentiment. It's respectful of other people. He goes on about those who silence others. To refuse a hearing to an opinion because they are sure that it is, it is false is to assume that their certainty is, is the same thing as absolute certainty. All silencing of discussion is an assumption of infallibility. You know, I find it so interesting that as the forced speech debate has developed, that in the public domain there have been so few lawyers speaking up for free speech. I can tell you that 25 years ago it would not have been the case. Um, it's also interesting that, you know, our finest text our most comprehensive text, I would say, on liberty is written not by a lawyer, someone who loves order and seeks rules for ordering things, but by a philosopher, a man who knows that it is often hard to know things for certain, and who, like Socrates, who influenced this book, sometimes sees that his greatest asset is knowing that he doesn't know. This is the wisdom of acknowledging our ignorance when we have it, and such wisdom has the effect of moderating us by creating intellectual humility, which can actually help people get along. Again, and this is really, really important, you don't know your side if you don't know their side. Quote, Mill, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good, and no one may have been able to refute them, but if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no grounds for preferring either opinion. Tell that to your favorite know-it-all. This may be one of the two or three most important points I'm going to make today. If government wants to take away the speech of someone you dislike, or force people to say things, and you agree with it. It's worse to go along when you agree with it. Mill, let us suppose, therefore, that the government is entirely at one with the people, and never thinks of exerting any power of coercion unless in agreement with what it conceives to be their voice. But I deny the right of the people to exercise such coercion, either by themselves or by their government. The power itself is illegitimate. The best government has no more title to it than the worst. It is as noxious or more noxious when exerted in accordance with public opinion than when in opposition to it. And I think it's more noxious. So this is why you shouldn't agree to be forced to do what you believe in. It's even more noxious to give government power when it's doing so is in accord with public opinion or yours because the coercion is sweetened, and that way can develop without opposition. In this short-sighted way, we enfeeble our chief protection against tyranny, liberty. Now I want to switch um, to a different ground, and I'm going to talk about um, three different approaches to the infallible mind, the divided brain, so it's a bit of a neuroscientific take, some things on psychological development, and then something called the inability to mentalize, which is a series of clinical observations. So this is our brain, and it's divided, and it's divided for a reason. A lot of people know it's divided, but don't think about the reason. Our spleen doesn't seem to be divided. Not every organ, our stomach is not divided in this way. Not every organ appears to be symmetrical and divided. And the divided brain isn't about language being on one side and creativity on the other. That was a simplification that came out of the 60s. There's little bits of truth to it, but it's far too simplified. But there are actually some very, very significant differences between the two sides of the brain. And the person who put this together is Dr. Ian McGilchrist. He's a psychiatrist. He's an outstanding intellect. I mean, he was a great student of literature as well. And this is his book, The Master and His Emissary. 
Now, if you look at the, this is looking at the brain from below. So you don't usually do that, I understand. But if you were underneath a brain, and you looked at it very carefully, in fact, you would find that it's broader at the right on the front and broader on the back at the left. So you know, it's only very grossly that it looks like the two hemispheres are identical. And inside, the connections are also quite different. So for instance, the length of the connections between cells in the right hemisphere is much longer. And it goes deep into the emotional parts of the brain and reads a lot of what's going on in the body. And the left brain connections are short. It's like they're all talking to each other. Now, one of the ways to get at the very broad difference between the left hemisphere and the right, sometimes called the left brain and the right, is imagine a bird pecking for seeds among these stones and grit. So to eat, it's got to focus very narrowly on the little seed and pick it out against the background grit. Narrow focus. But it also has to keep a wide focus and keep on the lookout for new dangers or opportunities that might come on the scene, like predators, potential mates, or other food sources. So this is more like reality. One of those birds is pecking, but it's also aware that there's another uh, comrade bird nearby. How does it do that? The narrow focus and the wide focus are actually handled by different hemispheres of the brain. Now, this is something very neat about a bird's brain. It's wired so that, let's say, the right eye is completely processed by the left hemisphere. So human beings aren't quite like that. So everything that comes in the window of the right eye is processed in the left hemisphere. So the left hemisphere does all of that narrow focus work to identify the little bits of seed. You're going to have to trust me. This is going to be relevant to political correctness. It focuses on something it already knows is of importance. So this is a big thing about the left hemisphere. It focuses on what it already knows is important, seeds. And the right hemisphere, it takes the world in as a whole. So its window to the world is the bird's left eye. So it's vigilantly, vigilantly searching for novelty, what's not already known, a predator or perhaps a new mate. It's looking for something new that might be of importance, but who knows what that would be. So the right hemisphere's attention is open-minded and broad-minded because it doesn't quite know what it's looking for. And these things are going on at the same time through different eyes and different hemispheres. It's not just switching back and forth. OK, that's a bird. What about humans? Our eyes are wired slightly differently. But the right hemisphere in humans is astoundingly similar. It sees holistically. So before things are digested into parts, it takes in the whole. It seeks novelty. It seeks out the unknown and new information. And because it's holistic, it sees everything in context. It has a sustained, broad, open alertness. It sees relationships. That's about context. And very important for our discussion today. It sees individuals. It sees if you, if you discover a human being and you see them as a unique individual in their wholeness, not in their parts, but how they all come together, that is a right brain function. It is not abstract at all. When you meet someone else who you never met for the first time, it's a unique experience. You're not generalizing from it yet. It is the seat of empathy. It's where we learn to read facial expressions and the emotions of others and our own emotions. And because it sees context, it sees humor. Lighten up. It understands metaphor. It perceives emotional subtlety and nuance. And the left hemisphere in humans, narrow, sharply focused attention to detail. It is actually tasked by the right hemisphere when something new and important is perceived to begin to map it and find detail. And then its maps produce isolated parts more than relationships or context. Think of that book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, if, if you've ever taken that course, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. It identifies things by abstract labels, not context, and it works with categories of people. Categories, not individuals. So whenever people are overgeneralizing about people, 
It has a left hemisphere flavor. Language is interpreted differently on the left and the right. It's interpreted literally. It's humorless because there's no sense of context. It's abstract. It rests things from their context. Context. Abstract is from the Latin, draw away. So what do I mean? One of the things that the left hemisphere does when it makes this map of the world is it confuses the map with the world. We've all heard this, don't confuse the map with the territory. That's a really good left hemisphere thing to do. Now, where is all of this data coming from? It's coming from hundreds and hundreds of studies of patients with strokes who lose main right hemisphere function or left hemisphere function. Or we can use certain kinds of magnetic devices and apply it to the brain and shut down parts of the brain and see what the remaining hemisphere is like and then give them all sorts of cognitive tests. And we can actually inject anesthetic into certain arteries and shut down a whole hemisphere of the brain. So there's many, many ways that really thousands and thousands of scientists have, have gotten at this. So the map is felt, so when people have certain kinds of left hemispheric strokes, uh, uh, sorry, when they have certain kinds of right hemispheric strokes and they're left just with the left hemisphere, we can see how concrete people are about maps. Now, the problem is with a good map is, as good as it is, is the world is always changing and maps become quickly out of date. There's a few that may not come out of, you know, go out of date quickly, like gravity seems to be what it's always been. But the left hemisphere is kind of like that person who, when lost, in a, in, you know, on a, on a car ride, says to his spouse, we can't be lost. It's right here on the map. We're in the right place. And he says it over and over again, even though they're not. So it's got a kind of know-it-allism, a flavor of infallibility, if you will. Let me give you an example of a literal versus non-literal interpretation. Imagine I was visiting your home, and I started to break out in a sweat, and I said, you know, it must be 90 degrees in here. Now, a literal interpretation would be Norman has made a statement, a meteorological statement, about the temperature. A non-literal interpretation would be, Norman, would you like me to open the window now? That statement takes into account the context of my statement. Its relationship to me, the speaker, and to the overall environment. It requires indirect interpretation and empathy. And these are right hemispheric attributes. So here they are, the difference. On the left, isolated, no context, no relationship, sees categories, abstraction, generalization, tends to infallibility, rigid, maps are the reality. And I would suggest to you, when there's bigotry, it's coming out of this kind of move, plus many other things, ideology, emotion, etc. But from a cognitive point, this is part of it. And the right is holistic. It sees individuals. It wants new information. OK. Now I'm going to link some of that up loosely with some things about developmental psychology that are relevant for political correctness. I'll tie it together. This is Jean Piaget. Um, probably the greatest developmental psychologist who ever lived. And one of the things he tried to do was describe norm, normal cognitive development. And he got a lot of it right. A lot of it holds up very well, even cross-culturally. There are some things, though, and I'm into the plastic brain, as you know, that can happen slightly differently in, in other places. But he made very, very broad observations after years and years of very fine detailed work. So here's some things he found out. There's an early cognitive stage from 2 to 7 where children don't understand logic and they have a lot of magical thinking. They have a limited sense that they have a mind that is perceiving the world from a, tic from a particular point of view. In fact, some of them probably don't have any sense of that. And I'll go into that. And then there's this thing called centrism. They can only focus on one aspect of the situation at a time. And this is related to egocentrism, which is a kind of where do I fit in the world um, sort of concept. It's not just about selfishness. During this stage, their communication and thoughts are generally about themselves. Uh, somewhat limited ability to see situations from another's point of view. They tend to assume that others see the world as they do. 
And some people can remain egocentric all their lives. Um, and many, if not all of us, can, under great emotional pressure or physical illness, regress and show signs of egocentrism that we nor normally don't. Now, why are children egocentric? Well, there's a number of reasons for this. But one very simple reason that's hard to get out of your head once you get it in your head is this. Children at this age are quite cognitively focused on the external physical world, which can be observed, and what they can observe of the social world. But our internal mental states are not directly observable, period. So the young child rarely has a concept of mental states or the mind. This means there's a kind of mind blindness, limited awareness that other people have minds, and more importantly, there is a limited awareness that they themselves have an invisible mind that is interpreting reality. And each of you try to remember that moment in your life, if you can, when you realize, actually, this is me processing all of this. I remember I was at nursery school, and I was looking. It, 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 no, no div divinity spoke to me at the time that I'm aware of. I was looking at some sticks. And I, I was just ripe, and I realized, I'm looking at those sticks, and other people aren't seeing those sticks. And somehow or other, it's self-consciousness, self-awareness, and the awareness that I had a mind, and that therefore other people had minds, crystallized at that moment for me. And each of you probably had that experience. Do any of you remember that? Now, what happens if you're not aware that you have a mind that's processing everything? Your subjective of experience of events seems like the only reality. You are not aware that your experience is just your take on events, that it might be a misinterpretation, a false belief, or a product of your experience. Interpretations are often centered on the self. Think of the child whose parents are getting divorced who thinks, it's my fault, it must be my fault. That's egocentrism. Now, we gradually grow out of it. The next stage, from 7 to 11, shows the beginning of new brain maturation. The child begins to use inductive logic, becomes aware of the existence of other minds. And this can often happen when they realize that you can fool people, that people can have false beliefs. And so Piaget did experiments on this. But for there to be a false belief means that there's got to be an internal mental process in the person who has the false belief that can be misled or mistaken, is somehow different, is processing events. <coughs> and then development proceeds, and abstract reasoning kicks in. Children can think logically. In language, they don't take everything literally. And children always love stories. But at this, at this point in time, they can begin to analyze the literature and get much more deeply into the minds of the characters. So they're mentalizing the ability to appreciate that one has a mind that interprets reality and that other people have such a mind. When you mentalize well, you don't even know you're doing it. It's automatic. It's unconscious. We realize, too, that we make inferences about reality all the time and are prone to error. We realize that the mental states of other people change rapidly, and the only sensible way to know what they are feeling is to inquire or to take a curious stance. If Socrates was the smartest man in ancient Greece, why did he spend all of his time talking to other people where, who were his, arguably his inferiors much of the time? It's because there's something motoric about thinking and learning, and that's why dialogue is a very important thing. So, you can say, you know, I'd be pretty good in a totalitarian regime. I'm very independently minded. I would just keep my mouth shut. And if there was no freedom of speech, I'd never express myself. And that might work. And also, you might get very, very sick. You might get sick because it might be that if thinking is so important to you, then expressing it and interacting with people about it might just be the thing you need the way you know, some of us need to breathe air. So when we mentalize well, we can focus on others. We can form stable relationships. 
This is all the opposite of the infallible frame of mind. Now, I want to talk about the absence of mentalization in adults, not in kids. There are many situations where we lose awareness that we have a mind interpreting reality. As I said, high states of stress and emotion. And some people never uh, develop the ability to mentalize in the first place. And some have mental illnesses that make it hard to mentalize um, or to think or imagine. If you're trapped in a very intense delusion, um, you are probably not mentalizing. Um, one of the things we've learned about men we've learned a lot about mentalizing and its absence by studying the autistic spectrum. And for a number of autistic children, it's very, very difficult. You can be very high on the spectrum and have difficulty reading um, emotions and mentalizing other minds. And in fact, the term mind blindness came out of the literature on autism. And children with autism are teased mercilessly, as, as, as you know, it's awful. And imagine what it's like for them not being able to understand other minds when kids are teasing them when they miss things. And then they will also misinterpret teasing or things that were, were very gentle remarks not to meant to, um, to tease a child if you can't mentalize. So it, it's, it's a terrible trap. There's another thing that happens which, where people arguably can mentalize, but they don't. And that's in you know, extreme forms of narcissism. So what the narcissist does is just imagine, a, imagine I'm a big narcissist. Um, what I do is, and I'm dealing with, with you, uh, I take all of my negative qualities and I attribute to, to them, to, to you rather. I keep all my, my good qualities. So now I'm very pure. But I don't stop there. Then I plagiarize all your special qualities and think they're mine. So if you're in a meeting with a narcissist, you come up with a great idea. He says, what a great meeting. I can't believe I came up with that idea. Do you know? So imagine you're in a knowledge culture or in a situation where knowledge is important or in an ethnic group where knowledge is important. And you can get a lot of narcissistic know-it-allism going on, right? Um, people who never form close, secure attachments with others to help them read their feelings will have difficulty mentalizing. And there's a lot of psychiatric conditions where people um, have grown up without that input. There was nothing malign. The parents may have had difficulty reading emotions, but then the child has difficulty reading emotions and difficulty mentalizing. But you can see there are just many different causes of mentalizing. And about, so I've said that in autism, there's often a lot of right hemispheric damage. That helps to explain some of the mentalizing problems. But you know, in very high trauma, in PTSD for instance, we now know that the right hemisphere, parts of it actually go offline. They stop processing. And remember, that's the, the hemisphere that helps you pay attention to novelty. So you're stuck in a trauma, you're reliving it over and over again. You're in a new situation, but you can't even notice the new situation. And a lot of your feelings and your cognition is cut down. And you can't even read emotion properly. We need to be able to read emotion to read minds. When we can't mentalize, our mental reality becomes the outer reality. They're equivalent. They're isomorphic. Our internal world has all the power of the external world. And all our thoughts feel real and as vivid as intense sensory experience. We can be terrified by our own mental experience, therefore. It's so vivid, and we lack the normal ways of reassuring ourselves, such as saying, I'm just imagining this, or it might not happen. That doesn't happen. It's all real. So our negative thoughts about ourselves and others feel totally unalterable. They're set in concrete. And remember, you don't have to be mentally ill to e experience this kind of thing. Any of us can slip into non-mentalizing in extreme situations. And we become mind blind. How does that play out, though? We become intolerant of alternative perspectives. We are humorless. We are predisposed to massive generalizations and speak in absolute terms. Men are always. Women are always. 
We understand language literally and often misunderstand nuance. And so we tend to misinterpret others. This is important because we can't read them. We see them as malevolent, and we start blaming and fault-finding, and we get angry. There's rigidity and external focus when you don't have an internal life. We're prone to all or nothing thinking. Our thought processes rigidify. We stick to the first explanation that occurs to us. Think about all the arguments you know where someone makes a silly first explanation and then they dig into it. So there's a tendency to rigid quasi-infallibility and little awareness of how our behavior is impacting others. We're not mentalizing. This is really important now. Unable to perceive our internal states as internal, we focus on externals, such as school, government, the job, the neighbor, and what others say. And this causes a great problem for us. We become thin-skinned. Because when we're over-focused on externals and what others say, and we're unable to step back and reflect, our self-esteem regulation becomes a prisoner of what others think. When we don't mentalize, we become hyper-responsive to the, even the most benign criticism. We are trapped in what we perceive as their point of view about us, and critical words or disagreement can feel like violence because we're so sensitive, and that's why people say, you're invalidating my existence. So to summarize this psychological brain material, four things contribute to moving towards a state where we don't learn or recognize our points of, other points of view and tend toward the infallible frame of mind. Regression to earlier states of functioning under pressure, a reliance on left brain categorization, generalization, taking things out of context. And I can tell you, I could teach a person to become left brain. I can t take any number of ideologies and train them to become left-brained and turn off their right-brain function. Then we can have mind blindness for a variety of causes. And as a reminder, George Eliot showed anger makes us feel divine justice is on our side. So all the wisdom of the gods is with us when we are angry. Now this is the final section of my talk. And these are ancient insights into justice and anger. As we've said, political correctness is focused on justice and compassion. And the ancient philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Xenophon, Seneca, and so on, thought a lot about justice. But they didn't often speak about justice in and of itself. They saw it as one of four cardinal virtues. And the word for virtue in Greek is erite, and that means excellence. So it's something you cultivate. It's an excellence you cultivate. So the, and the four cardinal virtues, when you look at how they talked about them, were often described and um, are seen as interdependent. Cardinal comes from the Latin cardo, and it means that on which something turns or depends, like a hinge. And the idea is that a good life for the individual and the community depends on cultivating these virtues. And you have to do all of them. What are they? Justice, wisdom, moderation, and courage. And a virtue. The definition of a virtue, it's a way of behaving that's conducive to happiness over time. They have to be cultivated, and they have to be practiced. Virtues are a way of, vices are ways of behaving that are conducive to unhappiness, and they're also practiced. Now note, this is an important point. Compassion was not thought to be a virtue. It's only fairly recently, in some respects, that compassion was thought, has become a virtue. For the ancients, compassion was a feeling, something available immediately, almost to anyone, to a child. Thus, it wasn't something that was cultivated. It was part of the raw material of being a, a human being. I'm aware that there are Eastern practices. There are compassion meditations. There, in the East, compassion was something that was treated like a virtue. So here's justice. Justice is a good thing, so it's understood as a virtue. So it would seem the more justice we have, the better, the more the merrier. And this indeed is the assumption of most social justice activism. How, how can you have too much of a good thing? The ancients were interested in balance. 
and they saw that the virtues do not stand each alone. And in fact, by themselves, they can actually and sometimes even be problematic. They observed that the practice of justice, for instance, without wisdom or moderation, often led to terrible consequences, even in the, in the democracies. It's a painful truth. History's greatest crimes have been committed in the name of justice. In the name of justice, the Spanish Inquisition. In the name of justice, taking this man, an Anabaptist, and burning him alive for heresy. In the name of rights, our treasured human rights. In the name of the rights of man, the French Revolution's reign of terror. And this, ISIS, it's all about justice, according to them. So for the Greeks, justice by itself could spin out of control, and moderation was needed. This is a picture of Delphi, where our ancient writings tell us nothing in excess was inscribed. So moderation is needed for justice, because justice is so closely related in practice to the wish to punish. It can be harsh. It can be vengeful. Even those of us nice people who restrain ourselves from unjust acts often feel a strong resentment towards lawbreakers and wish to get even. We say, he got away with it. Kind of implying we would have liked to have done it, but we held back. The wish to punish is the wish to hurt. And Socrates points this out in several dialogues very effectively. So justice must be tempered. And it's tempered by moderation and wisdom. And the Bible would argue by mercy. This is a side of it. Justice can become suddenly harsh in groups. And Freud pointed out that people in groups can readily regress and express terrible hostility. One of the things he said in group psychology and the analysis of the ego was in groups, people delegate their conscience to their chosen leader of the time. And if the leader sanctions aggression, suddenly civilized people can rapidly become unbounded by conscience, and you can see the extraordinary aggression that can be lurking. Think of anti-Semitism in the Middle Ages. It wasn't just the sinners who sanctioned setting Jewish homes, synagogues, and people on fire, but the saints. And once a saint says kill, there's little stopping the crowd from becoming cruel, because in a way their conscience is permitting it. Now, you just saw private ju justice Simpson style. Private justice is relevant today um, because of changes, I think, in the various tribunals and legal codes um, that we're seeing, um, which are privileging subjectivity. Um, private justice can escalate false claims. One key reason historically for having public justice, a public justice system was to put an end to private feuds and revenge bloodbaths when people took justice in their own hands. Of course, the original justice was people doing justice in their own hands. So private feuds, of course, are driven by each party's subjective sense they're offended and their non-systematic interpretation of events. And public justice, at its best, attempts to use more objective evidentiary criteria than private justice. But the PC justice tribunals, by reintroducing the subjective sense of grievance that Professor Peterson has spoken about as a criterion for human rights violations, actually, I would argue, returns us to the perils of private justice, but now with public approval and public imperture. So now, why is wisdom necessary? Wouldn't it be nice if those kids who are shutting everyone down actually went to university and said, I'd like to be wise? It would actually help their cause, because if you are not wise, you really cannot know what is right and wrong. And you may think you, it's an easy thing to tell all the time, but there's so many disputes about justice through the world that clearly people are having trouble sorting that out. And in Plato's Republic, which is also called On the Just, he begins it 
um, with Socrates asking people to define justice. People are demanding it. Say, okay, tell me what you want. And none of them can define it. They all fall apart. I can't talk about it here today, but that's the brilliant beginning of Plato's Republic. And ultimately, he shows us that justice requires balance in the entire personality and in the city, uh, and it relates to moderation and wisdom and courage. Now, why courage? Without courage, you can't stand up for what is just. And not everyone agrees on what outcome is just, though there is a fight. And entering that fight requires grit, and it entails risk. Now, I ask you to think of all the university administrators of our day who have caved in across North America and let one lecture after another be shut down without a fight, betraying their mission, their university mission, and their mission to their students. Sometimes they agree with shutting these things down. But I think more often it's um, a lack of courage uh, and careerism mixed together. But physical courage is not enough to guarantee justice because you need intellectual courage to have wisdom. Wisdom requires the willingness to undertake free inquiry and take apart and examine your own soothing fictions and beliefs, face human morality, mortality, and your limits. Mill, who drew very much from Socrates, argued that free inquiry was the major basis, or one of the major bases for freedom of speech. So ultimately, the virtues are independent. Justice depends on courage, moderation, and wisdom. And wisdom depends on intellectual courage. For the ancients, politics is not the only way, and at times, not even the best way to improve the world. The cultivation of your own virtue can have a great impact on others. What community would not be better off with people who cultivate, cultivate wisdom, moderation, courage, and justice? So I'm moving to a summation now. These are our PC paradoxes. These are our goals on the left, and these are our methods on the right. Inclusiveness, a goal. Method, ostracism, firing opponents, res demanding resignations. A goal, tolerance and diversity. Method, intolerance of diversity of opinion, as Obama noted. Openness, method, closed to aspects of traditional society and religion and many other things. Kindness and compassion. Yet they demand punishment of opponents, even for unintentional discrimination, firing people, internet shaming, slander, and character assassination. Living together. Unfortunately, now on US college campuses, there are a number of student groups who want to segregate themselves by ethnic group. Being non judgmental and non prejudiced, yet using the idea of privilege to condemn whole groups as guilty of an original sin by their birth. Whole groups called bigoted, sexist, violent, and judgmental of themselves, by the way, very judgmental of themselves, not just others. Finally, transparency and yet the endorsement of anonymous complaints. History shows the higher, the more utopian the goal, the easier it becomes to justify barbarous ends to get there. The more unrealistic the goal, the more likely the failure, the greater the impatience, and the greater the need for scapegoats. The greatest evils in human history, in terms of innocents murdered, Mao's Cultural Revolution, the Soviet murder of its citizens, the Holocaust, were all done in the name of justice. You'll notice I haven't discussed ideology, because Professor Peterson's going to talk about that. And there are many, many deep strands to enrich this discussion when looking at the narratives and what people are trying to do. But just in terms of the infallibility question, ideologies are belief systems based on myth, disguised as science or philosophy that overly simplify our complex world around one or two or several ideas. And because they fail to account for its complexity, they tend to become doctrinaire and um, posed as infallible and challenged. There is even an ideology-seeking ideology temperament. Eric Hoffer, who wrote The True Believer, described a very interesting phenomenon, which is during Hitler's rise to power, when there were Nazis and communists on the street, and after the end of the Second World War, where there were still Nazis about and communists in Eastern Europe, people would often switch from being a communist to a Nazi or a Nazi to a communist, even though 
superficially, these were very, very different ideologies that you know, hated each other. And one of the things that Hoffer was able to point out when he analyzed these people is they were fanatics. And fanatics were people who had a sense of self which they completely detested. So to say they had low self-esteem doesn't quite capture how hostile and angry they were to themselves. And what the ideology did to them is it didn't grow their self. They didn't want to grow that sick self. It obliterated their self. They wanted obliteration. And there are other people that I've seen over the years who show signs not of a, a terrible negative self so much as not having a strong sense of self at all. And they can turn to ideology which gives them the structure they feel they don't have internally. And if they're not mentalizing, it's very appealing. So some final words on forced speech. That triggered us getting together and talking to you today. Um, Professor Peterson pointed out that there's a tangle of laws in Canada which, if taken together, can be read as allowing the government to, in, in effect, force people to say things they don't believe. And some people like to say, oh, that couldn't be possible, it didn't happen, and Professor Peterson got two letters from U of T, well-lawyered letters, basically saying, you've got to change your position on forced speech. In other words, they read it the way he did. And he debated a professor of law who basically said, yes, I, it's possible that you uh, could be called before the tribunal if you don't go along with saying words um, that we think are now mandated. And the head of the Ontario Human Rights Commission, when asked, well, is he in violation? She repeated the law. She didn't say, oh no, that couldn't happen here in Ontario. And then the lawyers he consulted and others since. So there's free speech and there is forced speech. This is our charter. Section 2B grants everyone freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression. Notice op expression comes last. The first part is thought, belief, opinion expression, including freedom of the press and other media of communication. The rights are together because they're connected. Free expression is a necessity, a necessary condition for the free formation of thought and belief. And anyone who wants to argue that compelling a person to say things they don't believe in is not a violation of their freedom of thought, belief, and opinion um, seems to me to be very much stretching the charter. It's a case of government and the proponents of forced speech not trusting sufficiently in the goodness of most Canadians and the fact that they have diverse opinions and that we can benefit, as President Obama said, when opinions collide. It is a lapse into the infallible state of mind. But isn't it just a matter of etiquette? Isn't it good manners? Well, it might be if government didn't bring force into it. When's the last time you were forced to have good manners? Government can command many things by force, but they cannot command respect, even for others, with force. And respect is, I suggest, and I suspect, precisely what the people involved in this controversy really yearn for. So I think it's actually quite amazing that those who drafted this legislation have not summoned the creativity to find a solution to this problem that does not trample on other rights. But if you don't believe or don't agree with anything I've said so far, then I would say this. Always think of the next government. Breaking the taboo, enforcing, endorsing forced speech, creating a taste or tolerance for it, habituating people to it as a legitimate tool of power, is handing your opponents a new tool, a shiny new tool, and governments change. And you will have taught your opponents that one can use force and get away with it. And especially if you represent a minority or marginal group, and I bet you that many of us, depending on how you 
dissect things out, can be seen as part of a minority or marginal group. It is far better to persuade people than force them. If you force the changes, they'll only stay in place as long as you or your side holds government. But if you persuade people, they will be on your side even when government changes. Forced speech is a robotic solution to a problem that is best solved with two-way empathy and understanding. And in the historical, clinical, and scientific literature I've read that studies people being forced to say things in families, in concentration camps, in unusual political situations, in that literature, which studies people who are not trusted to be good enough to find their own way and say what they think, we see these people led into a kind of hopeless apathy and despair. It leads to a kind of abdication of authenticity and even their moral development. So I said that political correctness today is indeed mutually exclusive with freedom of speech. There's a tragic irony that the PC attack on free speech is that um, the tragic irony of the attack on free speech is that free speech is one of the most durable protections minorities and marginalized groups have ever had. And the shutdown and invalidation techniques undermine the very ideals they purport to defend and are based on the proponents claiming an infallible state of mind about what is compassionate, good, safe, and effective. In this kind of solution, nobody wins. Political, moral, and scientific progress, as well as our individual health, require a community that has a place for verbal argument. That's not violence. It's the sublimation of our differences into a verbal form far less vicious than true violence. So the very individuality that PC proponents treasure derives from liberty, which itself must be protected from two equally powerful human tendencies, that of authoritarianism and human know-it-allism. And I conclude my last slide with Mill's wisdom and his principles, that mankind are not infallible, that their truths, for the most part, are only half-truths, that unity of opinion unless resulting from the fullest and freest comparison of opposite opinions is not desirable and diversity is not an evil but a good until mankind are much more capable than at present of recognizing all sides of the truth are principles applicable to men's modes of action not less than their opinions. Thank you.